Welcome to tonight's episode of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamantongo Kumalo. We're on episode 21. We all made it to Monday. I know every day seems like Monday or that day, whatever day it is, because we're certainly losing count. We're on day 46 of the national lockdown. And as many of us would have seen last week's regulation, uh, restriction, four restrictions, um, or regulations rather, changed. Um, and those changes essentially affected the way that we can and cannot move. So whether you're a renter or a landlord, you probably want to listen to this podcast. You want to make sense about what you can or cannot do with your tenants, with your lease agreements, with evictions. And to help us understand this, uh, Silna Stain, who's the Managing Director of SSLR Incorporated, will be helping us. So we'll be looking at what the updated level four restrictions mean for renters and landlords. Silna, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Oh, thanks so much, Inga. Thank you so much for having me. So it seems like you're our resident lockdown report <laughs> updater, <laughs> only <laughs> helping us make sense of what these new regulations essentially mean for those of us who are in the property space, whether you're owning a property or you're renting a property, really trying to understand and navigate what it means. I think, firstly, before we even look at what we can or cannot do, let's look at what the regulation actually says. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's quite explicit um, in terms of the conditions under which we can move or who can move. Um, and they, they even say that we can move until the, the, you know, the 7th of June. I know when many people saw that, uh, some of them thought, oh my God, we're still going to be here in June. Um, and some people thinking maybe it's just going to be like this for the rest of the year. What exactly does the regulation um, say with reference to what we, or who can move or under which conditions we can essentially move? All right, so the regulation specifically says <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to have to again start at the first regulation. So I'm going to have to irritate everybody now and just quickly explain when we talk about regulations, what are we talking about? And I know this because I've done quite a few webinars on, on this particular topic. And I know afterwards everybody's so confused because I talk of these regulations as if everybody has seen them. So let's start there. The regulations, guys are the regulations issued by the different ministers in terms of the Disaster Management Act? Because remember, the moment you declare a national state of disaster, the Disaster Management Act kicks in. And with that, a lot of rights are getting limited. You're allowed to do that. It's, for instance, the right of freedom, uh, freedom of movement. And everybody's like, oh, but that is a constitutional right. How can we limit that? We have a section in the Constitution, Section uh, 36, which is part of the human rights, which says any one of the rights in the Constitution even may be limited if there's another right weighing heavier than that one. So the right to life, for instance, yeah, yeah. for an elderly person or for anybody who's now we see that, I mean, it's not just the elderly that, that unfortunately succumbed to, to COVID-19, but the right of life does weigh heavier than the right of freedom to movement. You get what I'm saying? So this, yeah. this is allowed. And so what the National Disaster Management Act says is when the, the ministers now run the country in a different way under regulations that, that's now limiting the normal legislation that, we, that we're working with. They issue regulations which will limit some, some legislation, even, even as far as the constitution, which we are seeing, no panic, it's the way it should be. But the regulations, there was a first set of regulations issued. Remember, the first day we heard about this was on the 15th of June, that Sunday evening, when the president said, of March. Mar March, look at me already being in June. <laughs> <laughs> the 15th of March, when the president said, um, we're now in a national state of disaster. And then with the schools being closed and everything, we started seeing the first regulations. Then the lockdown was part of the regulations, but the first set of regulations, defines lockdown and lockdown is defined as the period 23.59 on the 26th of March. So one minute before 12 on the 26th of the March, lockdown will start and it ends on the 30th of April, 2020. 
Okay, so I'm not making the lockdown time up. This is defined, but it's not in these updated regulations because we still have the initial regulations with the initial definitions. So mm. that's something very important to know. Lockdown period, 26 March to 30 April. And everybody's saying, but we're still in lockdown. We're in level four of lockdown now. We're not still in full lockdown. So that's the story of it. And the long and the short of that regulation, updated regulation that came out on the 7th of May in the, it was gazetted in the government gazette. I am thinking the number was number 43, uh, 42, something like that. <laughs> I remember the re regulation, the government gazette number, um, 283. That's the end of the number there. And that was published on the 7th of May. And what we said in that regulation, what the minister said is, People are not just allowed to return, because remember in the initial it regulation, was, return, yes. was yes. just return. Now they said, okay, it's not just return, but it's also for properties that was transferred prior to lockdown. So if transfer occurred prior to the 26th of March, you can move. Or if there was a lease agreement, and yes, the fun fact, if there was a lease agreement that was concluded prior to lockdown, prior or during lockdown. So it means prior to or up until the 30th of April. Of April yes. Those people can move. And the regulations regarding moving companies is then also extended. So a moving company will be allowed to assist with the relocation um, within the Republic of South Africa. That's very important. You can't load your stuff and immigrate now. Now is not your time. But within the, within the Republic, you can move. And I think then let's also look at, I mean, I mean the, the regulation actually does stipulate that firstly, you know, persons can move. Um, and then that second one is you're essentially allowed to move your furniture. So whatever goods that need to be moved or furniture that needs to be moved um, because you're making that movement is allowed. However, the same gazette regulations also then have the, the special permit that you would need in order to move. Can you just um, take us through that permit? Because it's not a, okay, now I want to go back home. Actually, no longer I want to stay here. I'm just gonna pack up my bags and go. There's a permit that you need and there's essentially steps that you need to follow before you make that move. Yes, 100%. So the permit forms part of this gazette document. So it's available. I don't know if you can. Um, I, I will send it to you and you're more than welcome to post it on your on your page as well if, if you don't have it. Um, so it's form one of these regulations. So the form has to be completed. You have to attach to that form the, the lease agreement. You need to record in the form the end date of the previous lease, the commencement date of the new lease agreement, and then you attach the actual um, lease agreement as well. Or you need to show proof that transfer occurred. And so this will be a letter from the conveyancer confirming that transfer took place prior to the 26th of March. You go to the police station, the station commander, or a person instructed on behalf of the station commander can stamp this. I kid you not, there is like a little spot on the form official stamp we want an official stamp there then yeah. you can move my suggestion is 100 percent to not try and circumvent this because if you try to be clever on this one and you think you're just gonna have your brother-in-law who was a police officer way back when just dig up his old stamp and you uh, uh, to stamp something like that or, or you don't feel like going to the police um, you're going to spend a lot more time with the police uh, when you're in jail for six months. Yeah. And, and so, no, so, that, I mean, so essentially, your, your people moving into new places are essentially covered, uh, whether it's the place that you would have you know, bought and was registered, or perhaps somebody who's moving into a new place and they've entered this agreement prior to the lockdown. What about people who? you know, since lockdown has happened, essentially your financial status has changed and you're not moving to a new place, um, but instead perhaps you're moving home or you're moving in with your friend uh, because you can see that you won't be able to stay in the current place. And suppose your rental agreement was essentially going, 
was already ending on the 30th of April. So for May's purposes, perhaps you're already on a month to month basis. And now you're able to say to a landlord, perhaps let's make this the last month um, so that I'm able to move before that 7 June deadline. What kind of um, documentation can they present given that as much as they'll have the lease that would have expired, they certainly won't have a new lease agreement that would have kicked in whether it's the 1st of May or the 1st of June. Yes, so a new lease agreement, I am happy with a new lease agreement as long as it contains the date of 30 April or before that. So a lot of people ask me, uh, but so now I didn't know at that time I can sign a lease. If there was a communication between you and the landlord and you already knew you're going to move as soon as lockdown allows, Remember, lease agreement doesn't have to be in writing. So to now conclude that agreement in writing and date it to reflect a date prior to or the 30th of April, because that was the time when the verbal agreement was, was concluded or where the intention between the parties came clear. Okay. You're going to be happy with that. However, for the tenant that has to cancel his lease agreement and move out to move in with his mother or family member or friends, whatever, you have an expired lease agreement or a cancelled lease agreement. Attach that to the document. Make an affidavit to say, I am not moving in to a new lease premises unless you can do that. If you're going to move in with family, you can do a lease agreement and you can say that you're going to rent and your rent will only be paid at a later stage. You can do these things. And, and as long as it's dated, then in compliance with the regulations, you will be able to get your permit. But what I suggest, every police station is applying the regulations slightly differently. I don't. I don't think it's a. It's a bad thing. I'm not. Not saying anything bad about the police. I'm just saying. Remember, every station commander has to apply the rules as they understand it. So be very careful of watching a webinar and thinking this is a one size fits all rule because the station commander here and the station commander in Kuruman could very well feel very different about this. So we know to move, you need a police permit. The police does have the right to give these permits. So if you're going to move back to the family, my suggestion is go to the police station, do an affidavit to explain why you're not going to enter into a lease agreement, but why you have to move and mm -hmm. get an understanding of how your police station will enforce that rule and if they would be willing to give you a permit. If they are not, explain the situation and ask them what they would want from you to issue the permit. I do believe that's the safest route to take at this stage. So now we're going to take a quick break. After we come back, I actually want to ask a question around um, people, landlords in particular, who are looking at this as an opportunity to get a tenant for that vacant place. We're getting a lot of questions from landlords who are thinking, well, the previous month, my place was vacant because I couldn't get in a new person um, or perhaps the current tenant, um, their lease had expired. So they're going to use this opportunity to actually move. And now they are seeing that their place is going to remain vacant. They don't know how long we're going to be um, you know, under these uh, restrictions. And so they're seeing this as an opportunity to source a new tenant from scratch and perhaps get them in before that um, 7 June uh, deadline. So after the break, I want us to actually first just unpack that because I'm sure a lot of landlords are thinking this is affecting my cash flow and I have to do something about it. If you're sitting at home and you have any questions around what the level four restrictions or the updated level four restrictions mean for you as a tenant, as a landlord, do send us those questions and we'll be asking them. I'm joined by Silna Stein, who's the managing director of SSLR and we're unpacking what these new regulations essentially mean. We'll be back after this.
Welcome back to episode 21 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamandunga Kumala. I'm joined by Silna Stain, who's the Managing Director of SSLR Incorporated. And we're looking at what the level, what the updated level four restrictions mean for renters and landlords. Now, so now before the break, I did say that I want us to look at landlords who want to get new lease agreements. So the 30th of June, I mean, 30th of April, went, you know, came and gone, and they hadn't entered into new agreement, and they hadn't started or hadn't initiated a conversation with a potential tenant, no such conversation had, uh, you know, occurred. And now that they've, um, you know, we've seen government regulations being updated, they are seeing this as an opportunity to ensure that they get that tenant, um, because they don't know how long this is going to last. Are they essentially allowed to do that? Can they be soliciting you know, new, new tenants? Because the regulation seems to be quite clear around the perimeters under which um, you know, rental agreements can or cannot uh, be entered into. Yes, 100%. And um, uh, the, the most important thing is whether you're a landlord, an, a rental agent, whatever the case might be, real estate activities isn't allowed in level four extremely limited. Um, for instance, we, we um, are, are very sure that you would be able to get a permit issued, um, and, and we, we have to unpack that in more detail, um, to be able to do, for instance, an entry or an exit inspection, but viewings aren't allowed. So whether you're the landlord or whether you're an estate agent, you're not allowed to attend to these things at this stage. Remember, guys, we're not staying at home um, because we're all very tired and we decided the year 2020 is the year of rest and baking and getting fat. That wasn't really the thing. We are staying indoors to limit the spread of COVID-19, um, which is a very serious virus uh, that we can't just be like, oh, but I would really actually like to be outside. We all do. But unfortunately, this is the way it is. So the regulations are there to curb the spread of the virus. So to try and circumvent the regulations doesn't just expose you and your family to a risk. It's, it exposes everybody you then get in contact with to a risk. So mm -hmm. the truth is, if there was negotiations during the lockdown or prior to lockdown, so let's take this for an example. I am the landlord, you are the tenant. You wanted to take occupation. You had the viewing of the place, everything prior to lockdown. And we said, you know what, let's hold off until lockdown is finished so we can um, make the move. That landlord and tenant, you had the intention to conclude the agreement. You can now conclude an agreement. You can date it uh, to the date when the parties intended to conclude the agreement, and that must be before the 30th of April, you will then be allowed to move. But for a landlord or a rental agent to now start showing properties is definitely not just risky, it is in contravention of the regulations, and you will, without any doubt, when caught, be arrested. And what I need to say, and I say this the whole time, I'm so irritating about this, but remember, guys, this is not trying your luck and then get caught and then you have a slap on the wrist. This is a crime in terms of the National Disaster Management Act. This is pretty much similar to cutting a tank's tires in the middle of war. This is not how we roll. And, and the truth is the type of crime we took, I love my analogy there, don't you think? I think tires <laughs> on the tank. analogy there, so that's <laughs> so dramatic. <laughs> but, but, but the point I'm making is that our Disaster Management Act only kicks in in situations like war or yeah. like uh, what we are currently in. So it's very similar. And your, the crime that you will have recorded against your name is a crime in terms of the Disaster Management Act. Unfortunately, you will not see a visa anytime soon again. And so it is a so very that, serious criminal record. So you, essentially you're saying, you know, if a landlord decides to take their chance, um, you know, maybe try to solicit a new tenant or try to get a new tenant, uh, a range of viewing, should they be caught, you'd be arrested, you could get a criminal, essentially a criminal record. Yes, and a very serious criminal record. It's not that criminal record you sort of still carrying with you that one night when you decided not to take an Uber. It's not <laughs> on the same level. 
it's a very serious criminal record um, uh, to the point where you will not be able to get a visa from a lot of from a lot of countries. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, so you, you were talking earlier about permits and we've got a comment from Howard Mugetai who says permits talk about the new normal and they've got a crying emoji. And I'm sure so many people are, you know, increasingly growing frustrated about um, the admin of having to organize permits for the different um, services that they provide. Um, another question now, Silma, that I've seen a lot of landlords ask is, so now you've, you essentially suppose you're stuck with this tenant who hasn't been paying, um, and let's assume that they probably even haven't been paying prior to, to lockdown. Uh, lockdown is essentially ensured that they still stay in your property uh, because you couldn't evict them. And I want us to talk about evictions just after this, but the first, this question is, you know, can the landlord then turn off electricity or water? A lot of the you know, landlords have been asking, well, my tenant, it's the second month or the third month, they're not paying and now they're using this virus as an excuse to, to not honor their rental agreement or the, the lease agreement. Can I just turn off the water and electricity? Okay, so we start with what we can do and then I'll go to what we can't do. So what you can do is while even while we were in full lockdown, a tenant that's not paying rent, you can place him on terms. So you send a letter of demand from uh, TPN through the TPN system. Um, it's, it's really an easy to use letter that's, or whichever letter of demand you, you want to use. I specifically refer to the TPN letter of demand simply because I draft him. So I'm very happy with the content um, of the, the particular letter of demand. Get the letter of demand out, give the tenant 20 business days to remedy his breach. If he doesn't, we can cancel the agreement. Now, currently, um, through SSLR, we're doing a very special kind of letter, of uh, a cancellation letter. So we are saying the agreement's cancelled. You do have until the 7th of June to vacate. Get a permit to vacate. If you can't, show us in writing what the reason is why you can't get a permit. And the tenant that then doesn't vacate in this time period until the 7th of June, we can, without any doubt, commence with eviction. We can even go up to eviction order. And in specific cases, we can even get a court order to already execute in level four. Um, the guy, I mean, execute the eviction order, guys, not execute like it's done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was also a bit dramatic. But uh, we can even execute the eviction orders in very specific circumstances. In most cases, we will have to hold off on our execution of the eviction order until the end of level four, but the, uh, regulation 19 does allow execution in specific circumstances. So something very important here, guys, regulation 19 specifically refers to eviction in terms of by and ESTA. And it says we can obtain those eviction orders. We can also obtain commercial eviction orders. Okay. If you now disconnect utility supply or, or get yourself involved with any form of arbitrary eviction, usually it's just a spoliation order and you can end up with a nasty cost order against you. Currently, once again, we're talking a criminal offence. So uh, even before this, we did because in terms of the regulations to the unfair, uh, the unfair regulations to the Rental Housing Act already criminalised uh, arbitrary evictions, but at this stage, it's not just a crime in terms of the Rental Housing Act, it is also a crime in terms of the Disaster Management Act. So once again, much more serious, please don't disconnect. If it is to the point where the landlord really can't sustain the utility supply and the tenants not paying, um, contact an attorney for a potential approach to the High Court for a utility disconnection court order. That we can do, um, but unfortunately, uh, not unfortunately, it's never something you should be doing. Arbitrary evictions is naughty as it is, but now it's really, um, uh, the punishment for that is gonna be much more um, harsh than it was uh, before, before COVID-19. So essentially, um, especially for landlords, because I know that there are some who are, unfortunately, you know, do, probably aren't as friendly as we are or might take uh, harsher ways to deal with tenants um, relative to probably yourself and myself. Um, 
in the event where your tenant is not paying and you switch off water and electricity, what you're essentially saying is that you could end up with a criminal record if you, if you do that. 100%. Um, so now we've got another question coming in from Stephanie Woodboy who asks, at which level do you believe one would be able to view any properties to purchase? So this isn't even to move in, but I mean to, to, to rent, but to essentially yes. purchase. So when, when will uh, estate agent, well, real estate uh, function become um, part of the regulations? Unfortunately, Stephanie, I, I wish I could answer that. And that is the million dollar question at this stage. Um, I, I wish we knew, we know obviously of the submissions made by Rebosa, but we've made submissions. I think almost everybody made submissions to ask for real estate to be able to, to work. We have no idea when that would be. And I think something very important is remember in the initial um, sort of draft regulations, we had a bit of an idea that it would be in level two. But remember, those were draft regulations. So we have no idea what level three, two, one and reg uh, regulations look like at this stage. So don't bargain on the draft regulations, but also don't necessarily hold your breath um, for level four functioning, we have no idea. Um, government has to make these decisions based on uh, very specific um, advice from scientists and doctors around what is safe and what isn't. Now, Silna, as of last week, uh, I mean, certainly the, the, the previous time we had spoken, we knew that deeds offices were entitled to open, but as of last week, they still hadn't opened. Um, I suppose it was because they still needed PPE. Um, you know, one of the questions that have come in is around whether or not, um, or people wanting to understand, um, A, when they, they, their bonds would essentially be registered. Because, you know, there's a case that I, I heard of of somebody who property had been sold, gone through the whole process, essentially just that last bit of the deeds office was missing. And then we were into lockdown. So offer had been accepted by both parties. Everybody has signed. They just hadn't lodged the, at the deeds office. And now, of course, with um, you know, with all these delays, we're now essentially on day 46. And there's typically an expiry date around, you know, when your the, the grant the bank has given you um, is going to hold. So both parties are essentially now a bit nervous. I mean, the the, the seller's nervous, they've works through quite a lot to ensure that their property is sold. The buyer is also nervous because maybe they might lose, you know, the bond that they've they've been granted by the bank. How do they um, try to make sense of that? I mean, I've seen certain reports even saying that perhaps banks might um, withdraw some of the offers or some of the, the grants that had been made to people um, prior to lockdown uh, because some of those essentially won't be lodged at the deeds office and we don't know how much longer this is actually going to to go on for yeah uh, it's a scary thing um there was talk now of a bunch of the deeds offices that would have opened today i just saw a circular from the pretoria attorneys association a little earlier today which said pretoria deeds office and definitely didn't open today uh, they still don't have the ppe um, I, I, I'm not sure about any one of the other deeds offices, to be honest. Um, I think we would have known if there was uh, deeds offices opening. I heard talk about deeds offices potentially opening on the 13th, which is Wednesday. Um, I, I, I don't know, guys. Uh, until they have PPE, it's not safe for anybody to go into the deeds offices anyway. So we're going to have to wait for them. But to your question, I am concerned about the bonds that couldn't be lodged, the transfers that couldn't be lodged. Um, luckily, your offer to purchase remains in place. And it's not like your offer to purchase, if you don't register within a specific time period, will just lapse. The parties can obviously, if one of the parties refused to do the things necessary to transfer, obviously, there would be grounds to place that party on terms and potentially cancel. At this stage, that's not um, on the cards because none of the parties are in default. We can't transfer. So nothing bad will happen to your offer to purchase. However, the banks could definitely, uh, would be in a position to relook the bond grant, especially if the applicant's uh, financial position changed substantially. And in that situation, 
where a bond is then withdrawn, it depends on the way that the suspensive condition was drafted, whether that entire agreement will then just lapse and it's like it never happened or not. So unfortunately, I can't give a blanket answer because the drafting of the suspensive condition will be very relevant. And just on that, um, Silna, you know, are people able to sort of retrospectively add a suspensive clause? So, I mean, they probably wouldn't have been preemptively be able to, you know, predict that lockdown would be this long. We initially thought 21 days and maybe thought we might go back to relative normalcy, but we're seeing that that's not the case. So are they now able to say, you know what, we don't know how long this is going to take. Maybe let's retrospectively add a particular clause that would make it so that um, this deal doesn't lapse. Are they able to do that? Yeah. Definitely not a retrospective suspensive condition. What you would be able to do is you are always able to amend the terms of any agreement between the parties in writing. So you will do an addendum, for instance, saying, um, if this lockdown continues and if the banks then reassess, so say for instance, this dispensive condition wouldn't allow the lapsing of the agreement, if the bank withdraws the, uh, the bond grant at any stage, the parties can bring, can bring an amendment to the agreement like that. I would, however, um, be very reluctant to just jump into amending agreements simply because most offers to purchase, the way your suspensive condition is drafted will typically protect a purchaser in a situation like this anyway. Thus leave the, the seller to an in an extremely vulnerable position because the worst fulfillment of the suspensive condition and now it can be potentially withdrawn. So as the seller and the purchaser, you can definitely enter into an amendment of the agreement, for instance, the purchaser that now knows that he lost all his income, he was retrenched, it's not coming back, he will not be able to pay that bond. Those parties can buy agreement, agree to cancel the agreement based on this. And the seller can then, as soon as uh, real estate duties uh, are back, to, back on track again, find a new purchaser as quickly as possible. This is unfortunately the, the situation. The purchaser who is getting the bond, but just doesn't want it anymore, but can theoretically, unfortunately, um, I, unless there's something very specific in the agreement with your bank, unfortunately, you're going to have to take the registration as soon as the deeds office um, is in a position to, to register that bond in your name. And so now we've got another question here coming in from Salman Dian, who asks, what can you do if a tenant does not want to pay, but does not want to produce bank statements uh, or a letter from their employers stating that they have been temporarily unemployed? Well, you place him on terms. So you're going to do a normal letter of demand, give the tenant 20 business days. If the CPA applies or if the CPA doesn't apply, whichever amount of days the parties agree to in the lease agreement, um, to remedy his bridge, so pay his full rent. And if he doesn't, you can cancel and we can commence with eviction. Um, and another question here, I think we've actually, you know, briefly touched on it in one of our previous conversations, Silna. This one coming in from Linda Dalton, who asks, can we negotiate rental with the landlord? And let's assume this is for instances where you already have a rental agreement in place. Suppose you're paying 6,000 in rental and you now can see that your finances have been significantly um, affected and perhaps you can afford 4,500 or 5,000 rents. Are you able to renegotiate essentially the terms of that lease agreement and perhaps agree to a lower amount? Yes, so there's no obligation on a landlord at this stage to allow for a reduced payment. And at the same time, there is nothing that gives the tenant the right um, to compel the landlord to give this to him, or there's definitely nothing that allows a tenant not to pay his rent. So unfortunately, it is um, in the landlord's hands whether he's going to give it to you or not. However, I have, uh, I think everybody's been seeing, I've been on about Ubuntu oh, lately. Yes. Yeah. Because I think Ubuntu is the only way we can get through this. So on that, I just need to make it clear, guys. Ubuntu is very much part of the South African legal system. 
Ubuntu, there's references to Ubuntu on the name in case law, um, more than 150 cases at this stage, actual legislation, and the Children's Act specifically includes the word Ubuntu. Um, Ubuntu, just in short, when people hear it, there's this fear thing where they think um, they're going to have to be, they're going to be a little bullied by the other party. That's not what Ubuntu is. Ubuntu is, um, is such a beautiful principle where you have to see the other party as a human being. So it, it brings in humaneness and it makes us see each other as human beings. And remember, that is 100% entrenched in our constitution. We, mm. we all have the right to life. We all have the right to be, be seen as human beings. So think about this. The moment you take the term party, out of, lit is, uh, out of litigation, and I see you as a human being. So I'm talking about you are a human, and I need to respect and appreciate you as I have to myself or any other friend or family member. Suddenly, mm -hmm. when you come to me and you say, Silna, I cannot afford to pay my rent, I have to, if I have the financial means to assist you, Ubuntu dictates that I have to doesn't mean I have to cut my own throat off to assist you. That's not Ubuntu. Ubuntu is helping each other and giving each other the dignity and respect that a human being deserves. And, uh, and that's exactly where I'm coming in. So on the landlord that doesn't want to, but can assist a tenant, I would like the tenant to see in writing, appeal to the landlord and appeal to his humanity and say, Mr. Landlord, I really can't afford this rent. I want to pay you back later um, and bring that in writing because the landlord then that stubbornly refused to do that is going to struggle with an eviction afterwards. The court will not not grant the eviction order, but the court could very well give the tenant a longer time to vacate before we can execute. But at the same time, the landlord that cannot afford to have a tenant pay reduced rent or not pay rent. I would like to see the landlord to also say in writing, Mr. Tenant, I wish I could help you, but I am financially not in a position to do so. And both parties then use Ubuntu, not in a, not in a bad way, but bring it into the conversation and show in writing so we can show to a court that both parties acted within the spirit of Ubuntu. So now I think we're going to leave it right there. I think one of the um, important things, if you want, you know, one of the big takeaways from this conversation, certainly for renters and, and, and landlords, um, I think beyond ensuring that we extend a bit of empathy to each other, um, the first thing that I'll probably say to, to landlords in particular is, if you are in a financial position to reduce or give your tenants um, discount, do so. And you can already preemptively do it. You don't need to wait for them to say they can't afford it. Uh, perhaps with some of them, even if it's a 5% reduction, uh, perhaps it's not going to um, heavily um, you know, have an effect on your cash flow. If you have the means to do it, certainly do it. Already start having the conversation with your tenants. I mean, it was already in episode one when we were speaking to Zekmiers as well as Gil Sperling, where we were talking about the importance of both the tenants and the landlords being proactive and having a conversation about what COVID-19 could potentially do, um, whether it's for the tenant or the landlord. So really have that conversation with your tenants and see how you're both able to meet each other halfway. And of course, we did say, Silna did uh, say that she's going to send the, the, the form that you're going to need for the permit. She has sent it through and the team will be posting it down below. So if you do need to move or your tenant needs to move, then that's the form that you need to download in order for them to be able to go to the police station, have it signed and stamped, and they'll be able to move around. So now, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's always a pleasure to, to chat to you. I'm sure, uh, should we have more updates uh, when we go to level three? I hope we go to level three soon. I will definitely have you back to understand those repercussions and get a sense of what we can or cannot do under new regulations. Thank you very much to Silna Stain. She's the Managing Director of SSLR. And we've been talking about what the updated level four restrictions mean for both renters and tenants. And this has been episode 21 of the Private Property Podcast. I've been your host, Zamantunga Kumalo. We'll be back again tomorrow evening. Good night. I hope you're staying home and you're staying safe.